Thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Um, this lecture is being held with a, uh, in connection with a workshop that we're holding this week at the University of Nebraska on the implications of a changing Arctic on the water resources and agriculture in the central United States. So we've been discussing today some of the linkages between what's going on in the Arctic with the disappearance of sea ice, warming temperatures uh, at a phenomenal rate and the implications of that for our particular region, specifically on water resources and agriculture, but it's certainly uh, broader than just those two, those two sectors. And so as part of our workshop, which runs through noon on Thursday, um, I wanted to organize a public lecture, so we had the opportunity for members of the community um, to listen to our keynote speaker, who has already given one talk today. Uh, so I asked her to do double duty and uh, give a second talk uh, for a broader audience, a more public audience. And so I welcome all of you that are here, but also those people that are watching uh, this program because it is being live streamed. Um, so let me introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, and following her comments, we will have a session of Q&A. We have a couple people that will be running microphones around uh, the auditorium. If you have questions, feel free to, uh, to ask those. Uh, Jennifer Francis is an associate research professor in the Department of Marine and Coastal Scientists, Sciences at uh, Rutgers University. Uh, she earned her bachelor's degree in meteorology from San Jose State University and a PhD in atmospheric sciences from the University of Washington. Uh, at Rutgers, she co-founded and co-directed the Rutgers Climate and Environmental Change Initiative, which was a precursor for the uh, Rutgers Climate Institute. Um, she studies Arctic climate change um, and global, Arctic global climate linkages uh, as part of her main research objective. And, and one of the interesting things about her that you, see, that you see in her bio is the fact that she and her husband circumnavigated the world in a sailboat uh, between 1980 and 1985. Uh, and this really uh, fostered her interest in the Arctic and changes that were going on in the Arctic. And so she has firsthand experience with that. So uh, I'd like for all of you to welcome uh, Jennifer to the, to the podium. Uh, I'll warn you, Jennifer, that you, for the most part, can't see the audience very well because of the bright lights, but they can see you. So anyway, let's welcome Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, can you hear me okay? Hard to see you guys out there. I warned you. Yes, you did. <laughs> All right. Well, that's okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out on what's it doing out there? Is it still? I haven't had a chance to get out. It's a little cloudy. It's not too bad. But um, it's a good night to be talking about crazy weather, I think, because it looks like we've got some pretty crazy weather in our near future coming to Nebraska. So it should be interesting for tomorrow. Yeah, so I want to talk about this topic that really I've only been involved with for the last three or so years of my career. And it's a very new topic for all of us, really, in this uh, community of, of people studying climate change and, and how it's linked to weather patterns. It, we haven't been studying this for very long. And um, I represent a group of people now. There's a lot of people working on this topic, trying to figure out all these different mechanisms. We've been talking about a lot of them today in our workshop. It's been very interesting. And um, I'm really glad to be here. So. We have such a cozy group here. If anybody has a question, uh, feel free to raise your hand or, or speak up, because uh, I don't want you to be confused at any point along the way. All right, so you've probably heard that the last couple of winters back on the East Coast, things have been um, less than ideal, less than optimum. Uh, some of my friends, I actually live in southeastern Massachusetts now, not in New Jersey anymore. Um, a lot of my friends who live around there and, and know what I do, um, we're, we're really getting quite upset. Um, this, these conditions went on for a very long time. We broke snow records in Boston and down where I live in southeastern Massachusetts. And you know, people were really getting quite irate about this. And Jennifer, it's all your fault. Do something. So a friend of mine took pity on me and sent me this cartoon, which um, kind of made me feel better. It kind of <laughs> summed up how everybody was kind of feeling about all this crazy weather that was going on. 
But people have very short memories. You got to look back only a couple of years and see a totally different scenario. So here we are back in March of 2012. And what do we see? Not severe cold, but extreme warmth. We broke over 3,000 high temperature records that winter. So keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that in a few, little while. So we are not alone here in uh, North America. All around the Northern Hemisphere, we've been seeing all kinds of um, extreme weather events. The last couple winters in the UK, has, they've been pounded by severe storms for weeks at a time, broke their 250-year-old um, precipitation record in certain parts of England. Parts of Japan, where they're used to seeing a lot of snow, saw even more snow than they're used to. You can't even imagine the snow plow that keeps that road clear. Flooding events in Europe and parts of Canada, all around the Northern Hemisphere, we've seen these types of flooding events as well. And of course, we know that California has been experiencing one of the worst droughts it's ever had. And we're not crazy. These extreme events are being measured not just by scientists, but also by businesses who really care about this, in particular insurance companies. So Munich Re, one of the biggest reinsurance companies in the world, keeps track of these extreme events. And what you're seeing here is going back to about 1980 and how the numbers of the various types of extreme events have been changing over time. So you'll see different color bars up there. The red bars are the types of events that are related to geophysical type um, occurrences. So things like earthquakes and volcanoes. You see that those are not changing over time. But the other three colors, the green, which are storms, the blue, which are flooding events, and the yellow, which are um, heat waves and droughts, those are all increasing with time. So the ones that we can connect in some way, perhaps to climate change, we see are increasing. So the kinds of extreme events that I'm talking about tonight are a particular kind. And these ones have all in common the fact that they're related to persistent weather patterns. So I'm not talking about tornadoes, and I'm not talking about hurricanes. I'm talking about extreme events that are related to weather conditions that stay the same for a long period of time. So you can imagine a drought, for example. Um, if it's dry for a few days, no big deal. But if that goes on for a month or longer, it becomes a real problem. So certain types of extreme events are related to, to these very persistent weather conditions. So I think you know, people are starting to notice that their weather patterns in their hometowns, in their backyards, are starting to change. Um, and they're starting to wonder, you know, what's going on? And they're starting to hear about whether there might be some link to climate change or not. This question is starting to come up over and over. And it hasn't been very long that people like me who study this kind of stuff have been comfortable answering this question because there haven't, it hasn't been that long that we've been able to look at studies that make robust statistical linkages and modeling studies that actually show that climate change is, is changing the probability of certain types of these extreme events. So more and more of us now are very comfortable answering this question and saying, absolutely, we can connect a lot of these types of extreme events to changes in the climate system. All right, so I want to step back before we get going here and look at the big picture. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen a graph like this before, where we're looking back in time about 450,000 years and looking at, first of all, how temperature has changed over this time period. So we'll look at the red curve first. Time is going backwards towards your left. And of course, we see that temperature of the Earth has gone up and down over the decades, over the centuries, and even over the millennia. And this is normal. We know why this happened. We know this is because the Earth's orbit is not the same all the time. It gets more um, round sometimes and more oblong sometimes. We know that the tilt of the Earth changes over time. And all of these things affect how the sun's energy comes to the Earth and changes the temperature. So we also see that blue curve there, which is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere going back almost half a million years. And we see that the carbon dioxide follows very closely with those changes in temperature. 
And again, we understand why that happens. So as the Earth warms, we tend to lose carbon dioxide from the oceans. It goes back into the atmosphere. We tend to thaw permafrost, and that releases carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So these two things are very coupled. But as you get over to the right-hand side of that graph, what you notice is the carbon dioxide, the blue curve, is shooting upward very rapidly. And of course, I think you all know why that is. It's because we've been burning fossil fuels at a pretty rapid rate for the last century or so. And that's caused the carbon dioxide to shoot up very rapidly before the Earth's temperature could catch up to that. So we see ourselves now in this situation where we have the amount of carbon dioxide is the highest we've seen in the Earth's atmosphere in at least 850,000 years. And the more recent studies suggest it's more like two and a half million years. So we're in uncharted territory here, as far as we know, certainly in the human experience. But as I said, the Earth's temperature has not caught up to this very high level of carbon dioxide because it's happened so darn fast. But we do know some things about what the Earth was like back when the last time, say 200, either 800,000 years ago or two and a half million years ago, we know that when the CO2 levels in the atmosphere were high like this, the Earth was a very different place. It was several degrees warmer, and the sea levels were tens of feet higher. So this is the trajectory that we're on. And that carbon dioxide, once it gets into the atmosphere, stays there for a long time, 100 years on average, more or less. So even if we could stop emitting carbon dioxide now, we're still going to go a long way towards this state of the climate system. I guess I should have issued a warning before I started this presentation because I don't have a lot of good news to tell you tonight. <laughs> so um, if you were happy when you came in, I'm sorry you're not going to be as happy when you leave. But you're going to learn something. So you've all heard of greenhouse gases, I'm sure. But just to make sure you understand why they're such a big deal, and carbon dioxide, of course, is one of them, I just wanted to explain very briefly why greenhouse gases matter so much. So if we look at a very simple diagram of how the Earth's energy comes and goes, we know that the sun is shining down on us. That sun is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, roughly. It's a very hot object, obviously. And hot things emit energy with very short wavelengths. So that sun's energy is able to pass right through our atmosphere, except for when it hits a cloud. And most of it makes it all the way down to the Earth, where it warms the surface of the Earth. Now, the Earth is much, much cooler, of course. It's on average about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And warm objects also emit energy, but it's at much longer wavelengths. Those long wavelengths, which we call infrared radiation, are absorbed very well by greenhouse gases. You can see that layer of greenhouse gases up there. So those greenhouse gases, when they absorb that energy emitted from the Earth, act like a blanket. And they trap that heat down near the surface of the Earth. So if you add more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, it's just like putting an extra blanket on your bed. It's not changing anything about you or the, your room, but it's trapping more heat, so it keeps you warmer. Well, the same thing is happening with greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. So I said that we've got all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and the Earth's temperature has not caught up to that level of carbon dioxide yet. But it's starting to, and that's what's being shown in this graph here. So going back about 1,000 years now and looking at the global average temperature difference from normal, what we see is that about 1,000 years ago, we were actually on a slight cooling trend. And this is related to those changes in the Earth's orbit that I talked about earlier. But you can see also recently, we've got this very sharp uptick in the Earth's temperature. And of course, this is the atmosphere starting to respond to having all that extra carbon dioxide in it. But we also know that that warming is not happening evenly around the Earth. So this is a little bit busy, but what it's showing are these, these are little maps of the Earth. So here's North America there and Asia. And they start in the early 1900s. So every map is one 10-year period going back to 1900. And it's showing the differences in temperature from 
normal, so some average period there. And what you see is that starting in 1910, and they progress every decade up until present, what you notice is that we get to, as we get up to here to present, so this is 2000 to 2010, and this is the last few years here, you can see very clearly that the warming is progressing pretty rapidly, especially in the last 50 years or so, but that warming is greatest in the high northern latitudes. The Arctic is warming much faster than everywhere else. So keep that in mind. So a lot of times I'm asked, well, how do we know that this warming that we're seeing is really because of people? You know, why, how do we know that this is really something that we're doing to the climate system? Well, we have a lot of tools available to us, actually. And one of the best things that we have that tells us that humans are doing this are what we call climate models. So these are these very complicated computer programs that are made up of a bunch of equations that basically simulate all the physics that happen in the climate system. Things like winds and rain and ice and even vegetation and soil moisture and all these things that happen in the climate system. So we can run these computer models, these climate models, and tell them about changes in the Earth's atmosphere or things that are happening to the Earth, like changes in the sun output, volcanic eruptions, changes in the Earth's orbit. And we can ask those computer models to tell us what the average temperature of the Earth should be based on that. So if we do that, we, and for the going back to 1900 or so, this black line is the temperature of the actual Earth, the true Earth. So that's the truth. The blue line there is the simulation by this computer model. And you can see that they agree pretty darn well up until 1960 or so. And then if we keep going, we see that the real world in black separates from the computer world in blue. And that's because we didn't tell the computer about the fact that carbon dioxide was increasing in the atmosphere and that other greenhouse gases were increasing. If we do that and we run the models again, we now have this red line is the model output and the black line again is the real world. And you see that they agree very well. The only way we can get the computer to simulate the actual Earth's temperature is to tell them about, tell the model about the increasing greenhouse gases. So that's one of the ways we know that these increasing carbon dioxide especially is causing the recent warming in the Earth. So not only is the Earth getting warmer, but it's also the atmosphere is gaining moisture. This is a huge deal. That moisture in the atmosphere has been increasing by about 7% since the 1970s or so, and that's what's being shown here. The reason that's so important is because that water vapor in the atmosphere does a bunch of important things. It provides fuel. It's the main fuel source for storms. And it's also a greenhouse gas. So it's accentuating what's already being caused by the carbon dioxide. It's amplifying that carbon dioxide warming. So it's acting like another blanket on top of the bed. But in addition to that, it's also contributing to a big increase in the frequency of heavy precipitation events. And this is something we talked about a lot today in our workshop because it has such an impact on agriculture, especially in this part of the world. So what you see there is a big increase. Those, fr those uh, percentages there are showing you how much um, these, the occurrence of these heavy precipitation events has changed since the end of the 20th century. All right, so getting to my love in, in my research in talking about the Arctic, let's take a look at what's happening with the Arctic sea ice. So this is another part of the climate system that's been changing quite rapidly, as I'm sure you've probably heard. Well, we can actually look at what's been happening to Arctic sea ice going back about 1,500 years. Of course, there was nobody up there to measure it back then, but what we can do is look at the sediments in the bottom of the Arctic Ocean and how they differ from place to place, because if there's sea ice floating on that ocean, you get different organisms growing in that water column than if you don't have sea ice, so different plankton species. So you can reconstruct how much ice there was floating on the Arctic Ocean in the summertime. So what you see is going back 
almost 1,500 years, you get these wiggles, some changes from year to year. And this is the extent of ice, so it's the area covered by the ice. And up until present here, which is this blue line, you can see that it was pretty steady, and now we're in this big decline. Well, back in 2012, so only a few years ago, we had the record lowest amount of sea ice ever recorded in the Arctic Ocean. And that isn't plotted on this graph. If we plot that point on this graph, it's there. It doesn't even fit on this graph. So we are now in very different territory than we've ever been. And you might have heard in the papers that since 2012, the sea ice has rebounded. It's regrown. Everything's fine. So let's put 2013 and 2014 on there. Big rebound. Get excited about that. And we just a few weeks ago hit the minimum for 2015 as well, which usually happens in mid-September. We can put that on there. You should be happy, right? All right, so just to drive this point home a little bit more, I have an animation of how the sea ice has been changing over the last several decades. Make this big. There we go. OK, so let me show, explain what you're looking at here. This is an animation that was created by NOAA and NASA. And it's based on satellite information that tracks um, features in the sea ice. So you can see the land masses here. There's Alaska, and there's Greenland, and Russia. There's Scandinavia. And so the white and blue colors are all where ice is occurring on the Arctic Ocean. So the colors correspond to the age of the ice, of those ice features that they're tracking. And you can see that down here on the scale, the white colors represent very old ice, so over eight or nine years old. And the blue colors is, are, represent very young ice. So it turns out that old ice is usually very thick, and young ice tends to be thin. So you can think of this as the white ice being thick and, and the blue ice being thin. So when I put this into motion, you're going to see a couple things. First of all, you're going to see the pulsing. So it's going to grow in the winter and shrink back in the summer. And you're also going to see the ice move in a, in a clockwise direction around the Arctic Ocean because that's the average winds. We tend to have a clockwise flow in the winds in the Arctic Ocean. So you can see the date going by the months and the year. And you can see how the ice generally flows in this clockwise direction around the Arctic Ocean, being blown by the winds and the ocean currents. And you can see that the thick ice tends to move around and then eventually get pushed out to the east of Greenland into the North Atlantic, where it eventually melts. So as we get up here into the middle 2000s, you'll start to see that old thick ice, that white ice there, start to disappear. And as we get up here close to present, you can see that it's just about gone. What's left up there in the Arctic is very thin. It's very broken. It's very vulnerable to any changes in winds or ocean currents that come along. It's a very different place now. I told you it was bad news. I did warn you. OK. So why do we care about the sea ice? Well, as you know, snow and ice is very white. And it's, it reflects most of the sunshine that hits it. So here I'm showing the white there is the ice as of that record low in 2012. And the pink line around it is where we'd expect to, it was the average position of the ice edge. Um, during the previous 30 years. So you can see that it's decreased approximately half in only 30 years. It's only half as big now as it was then. And in terms of thickness, if we calculate how thick it is now compared to only 30 years ago, it's decreased by about 60% in only 30 years. So because we've lost all this ice then, 
when the sunshine hits all that open water, instead of being reflected back to outer space, it's now going into the Arctic Ocean, heating up the Arctic Ocean, and then that heat then gets re-released into the atmosphere in the fall when that ocean starts to freeze up again. But all that heat that used to go into the outer space is now entering the climate system, whereas it didn't before. So this is contributing to something that we call Arctic amplification the rapid warming of the Arctic. I showed you how the Arctic was warming so much faster than everywhere else. Well, it's warming about two to three times faster than anywhere else on the planet. You can see that in, in the temperature record of the Arctic versus mid-latitudes. Mid-latitudes is where we all live here. And what we see is going back to the 19, late 1940s, the blue line here is the temperature for uh, mid-latitudes and the um, the turquoise line there is what's been happening in the Arctic. And you can see that just in the last 20 years or so, approximately, we see this big difference in the warming in the Arctic relative to mid-latitudes. And this is what we call Arctic amplification. And so why do we care about that? So we've got the ice disappearing. We've got the Arctic warming really fast. The reason we care is it's going to be explained now. So if you think about a layer of atmosphere that extends from here in Lincoln, Nebraska, all the way up to the Arctic, this is this layer, that's the blue line there. We know that warm air takes up more room than cold air. So this layer of atmosphere here in Lincoln is thicker than it is up in the Arctic, all right? So this creates a hill in the atmosphere. The air sitting on top of that hill wants to flow down just like water wants to flow down the hill of a mountain. So what happens is that air starts to flow from south to north, down the hill. But because the earth is spinning, that wind gets turned to the right. And this becomes what we call the jet stream. It's a very fast moving river of air high over our heads. And it's created because of this temperature difference between here and the Arctic. All right. Now think back to Arctic amplification, and what does that mean? So because it's warming faster in the Arctic than it is here, that hill is becoming less steep. The air is getting thicker in the Arctic than it is here, and so that wind that's been created has less force behind it, and the jet stream is getting weaker. Now we know that when the jet gets weaker, it tends to take a wavier path as it travels around the northern hemisphere. And that is important for a lot of reasons. First of all, this, this waviness in the jet stream is natural. There's always these north-south waves in the jet stream. But when the waves are small, like I'm showing in the schematic in the upper right there, you can see that they tend to move quite quickly from west to east against the background against the land. But when those waves get big, like I'm showing in the bottom right, which is what we think happens in response to the Arctic warming so fast, then they move much more slowly. Okay? So remember that. Big waves move slowly, little waves move fast. So why should you care about those waves moving fast and slow? Well, it turns out those waves are everything to do with our weather that we experience down here on the surface. So here's a schematic of a jet stream, this orange ribbon of fast moving air high over our heads up near where the jets fly. And the first thing you notice is that the jet stream basically separates cold air to the south, uh, cold air to the north from warm air to the south. So depending on whether the jet stream is north or south of you determines whether you're in warm air or cold air. So it's been quite warm here the last few days. That jet stream has been north of us but it's about to shift to the south, and we're going to be moving into some cold air here. So the other thing is those waves in the jet stream are what create the dynamics in the atmosphere that create storms in that part of the wave. So when the winds of the jet stream are from the southwest, this is the stormy pattern, all right? And when those winds are coming from the northwest in this part of the wave, you tend to be in a very settled pattern, clear skies, um, winds you know, dry conditions, all right? So where that wave is relative to your location determines whether you're in 
stormy conditions or nice conditions. So then you can imagine if those waves are moving more slowly, then that means those conditions that you're experiencing are going to last longer. They're going to be more persistent. All right, that all looks nice and simple and tidy. And now I'm going to show you what the real jet stream looks like. All right, so these are real winds measured um, by various means, weather balloons and satellites and so forth. And they've been put together in this animation by NASA, NASA's Science Visualization Studio. So where the colors are yellow and orange and red is where the winds are very strong. So you can pick out very easily with your eye where the jet stream is. But I want you to notice a few things. I want you to notice what a god-awful mess it is. All those swirls and all those little loops and all that stuff makes it very hard to measure whether these waves are changing in size, whether they're going faster, whether they're getting bigger, whether they're happening in different places. So just keep in mind you know, just what a, a messy creature we're dealing with here and trying to uh, figure out whether these changes that I've described in the jet stream are really happening or not. So the other thing I want you to notice is what I described before, and that is when the waves are small, like right there, you can see that they tend to move quite quickly across the continent. And then when they get really big, like this, they tend to move much more slowly. So this is the main message I want you to take home with you. And that is that if, in fact, these waves do get bigger, as we expect to happen as a result of the Arctic warming so fast, then weather patterns are going to become more persistent. And as a result, we should see more of these ex extreme events related to persi persistent weather happening more often. So the big question that we're grappling with now in the research world is, in fact, whether we're seeing more of these very wavy patterns happening or not. So I'm just going to give you a little taste of some of the ways we're trying to get at this. And there's, the, the answer is not done yet. We've still got a lot of work to do. But one of the ways we're doing it is we're looking at this layer of the atmosphere that I was describing before that's thicker here than it is in the Arctic. And we're looking at it like a topographic map that you'd use for hiking, all right? So you know that we're on a topographic map where you've got a mountain or high land, you're going to have high values on your topographic map. And where you've got valleys and dips, you're going to have low values. Well, the same thing shows up on this map of the atmosphere, this topographic map of the atmosphere. So here's North America here. And you can see this, these cold colors are low, sorry, low values of this thickness of this layer. And as you'd expect, it's, there are low values over the Arctic where it's cold and this layer is very thin. And as you go towards the equator, they get thicker and higher. So these lines here are just like on a topographic map. You know that if you walk on one of these lines of equal height or topography, that you'll stay on the same elevation as you're walking along. So the same thing is true with this layer of atmosphere. And you'll also know on a topographic map when those lines are very close together that it means that the hillside is very steep, right? So same thing for this. When we see those lines very close together, it means that layer of the atmosphere is very steep. It means that jet stream is located right there. So we can use these lines to trace out the shape of the waves in the jet stream. And that's what we're trying to do. So let's look at a couple of examples. We have an example here of what the, this topographic map um, in the Atlantic. Here's Spain right there, you might recognize. So here's Europe. And so this is a case where I showed you that flooding in Spain in the very beginning. This is what the atmosphere was doing at the time of that flooding event. You notice it's a very large wave, which means it's going to be very persistent. And we also see that this is the stormy part of the wave here, bringing a lot of moisture into Spain. And that's why we had this flooding event there. Another case is the attack of the polar vortex a couple of winters ago in eastern North America. So here's North America. Again, we have this very large wave parked over North America. 
and that led to this very persistent pattern of warm temperatures over California and cold stormy conditions in the east. So what we're doing is we're taking one of these lines of equal elevation in the atmosphere that corresponds to the core of the jet stream and basically every single day we're just measuring how far north it extends and how far south it extends. Very simple. And whenever that distance in latitude is larger than 35 degrees, we call that a high amplitude pattern. Very simple. And we do this every single day in different regions around the globe, and we can measure whether these high amplitude patterns are in fact happening more or less often. So what do we find? Well, if we look at the whole northern hemisphere, this green line here, which starts at about 1979, is showing how often we see these high amplitude patterns occurring. And as what you see is that there's a big increase in the frequency of these high amplitude patterns. Also plotted on here is the speed of the west to east winds of the jet stream. And as I told you, when the jet stream gets weaker, we tend to see the jet gets wavier, and this seems to confirm that relationship. So the wind is getting weaker, and these high amplitude patterns are happening more often. If we focus in on the Atlantic, just the Atlantic sector now, we see an even bigger increase in the frequency of these high amplitude patterns and a decrease in the winds. So this seems to be hanging together. All right, so why do we care about these high amplitude patterns? And what we're learning rec just recently, this uh, new idea has come up where we're learning that when we get these high amplitude patterns, it may not interact with the Arctic every single time. And the reason is because you have to have the warming in the Arctic happening in the right place to intersect with one of these high amplitude patterns. Now let me show you what I mean. And we call this, it takes two to tango hypothesis. So back in the good old days, when we had, if we're looking in the Pacific Ocean here, and there's North America, and we had a lot of ice up in the Arctic Ocean. And one of these waves in the jet stream came along. Let's say, um, you know, the sea surface temperatures in the Pacific tended to cause it to happen in this particular location. Um, the this Arctic wasn't really doing anything back then because it wasn't extra warm. We, didn't, we hadn't lost a lot of ice yet. But as we fast forward to the present day, and I'm showing here an example of where we've got ice lost in the Pacific part of the Arctic Ocean now. We, because we've lost all that ice, it's absorbing a lot of extra heat from the sun. That extra heat gets released back into the atmosphere and it creates like a bubble of, of heating in the atmosphere over that location. So the idea is that the two to tango, you've, if you get a wave in the jet stream that comes along that looks like that, all right, that peak in the ridge there is not going to be affected by the heating in that area of ice loss because it's not located in the same position. But if something causes the wave to occur here instead, that ridge there, that northward bulge in the jet stream is going to be intensified by that extra heating where the ice was lost. It's going to cause that ridge to be stronger, it's going to extend farther northward, and it's going to make the wave bigger, which makes it more persistent. So this is a kind of a recent idea um, that explains why some years we get these high amplitude pat patterns perhaps happening more often than other years. So it takes these two necessary factors, and neither one alone will do this. Okay, so wrapping up here, we're going to think about some more specific examples of recent events and see how the jet stream patterns um, correspond to these extreme events. So remember I told you I'd come back to this March of 2012 when we had over 3,000 high temperature records broken instead of cold. So those are being shown there. This is what it looked like last winter, where we had extreme cold in the eastern half of the country and warm all the way from California up to Alaska, two opposite scenarios, basically. Well, you can probably imagine in your mind now what the jet stream looked like corresponding to these two scenarios, but I'm going to show you. So that March 2012 case, we had a big 
ridge, one of these big northward swings over the east, allowed all that warm air from the tropics to come up into the east with a dip in the uh, southward dip, which we call a trough over the west. And as you can imagine, it looked just the opposite in um, this last winter and the winter before too. So the idea though is that in both cases, they were really big waves in the jet stream. They were both very persistent patterns, but with very different temperature patterns. So you can't take, if you took those two years and averaged them together, and you wanted to look at how temperatures had changed in, the, in North America, you'd come out with no change. So you have to look at these things in a, in a very short time scale, and that's why we're trying to measure them on a daily basis. So we can back up and look at this last winter pattern and how it looked over the whole northern hemisphere. So this white line here is tracing out the jet stream. Here's North America over to Europe. And what we see is that it wasn't just wavy over North America. It was wavy all around the northern hemisphere. The colors here are showing you where it's warmer than normal or colder than normal. And if you think back to what was going on in this, this was actually the winter before of 2013-14, Remember, um, I told you that, the, that England was having a lot of storms. Well, there's that, that jet stream coming in, bringing a lot of moisture from the Atlantic. You remember Sochi Olympics were happening. They were having a lot of trouble keeping snow on the slopes for the Olympics. That's because there was this big persistent ridge parked over them. So this was a, a hemispheric wide situation where the jet stream was very, very wavy. And remember, um, the ice was also very low at that time. So the Arctic was very warm. So people are talking a lot now about, OK, we've got this big El Nino out there. Well, how does this story fit into the El Nino story? Well, I don't really know, to tell you the truth. Because as we look at an El Nino from the past, the last really strong El Nino is shown here on the left. This is the Pacific Ocean here. It's what the sea surface temperature um, anomalies or differences from normal look like in that El Nino. And you can see here South America with this very tongue of very warm water sticking out into the Pacific. And if we think about what that does to that hill in the atmosphere, this is a very useful concept. So basically the El Nino makes that layer of the atmosphere much thicker over the tropics. And so it's actually making that hill steeper in that area. And so it causes a stronger jet stream. And that is what is responsible for, responsible for making um, very stormy conditions in California during an El Nino year. But over on the right here is what's happening now, basically. This is a couple months ago now, but it looks very similar. And what we see is that there's a lot of other stuff going on besides the standard El Nino pattern. We have what we call the blob. It's this area of very warm water off the um, coast of California and British Columbia. We also have a very warm Arctic happening. And not shown here, we also have a very cool blob of water in the Atlantic Ocean. So we have all these factors that have never occurred at the same time together before. So what's going to happen with this El Nino, I think, is a big question mark. When people ask me for a forecast for this winter, I just tell them it's going to be really interesting. All right, so I'm going to sum things up now and just sort of revisit this whole uh, concept of how Arctic warming, this rapid Arctic warming, is connected with extreme weather. So these red colors here looking down on the North Pole are showing us how that thickness of the atmosphere has changed over the last couple of decades. Where it's red, it means the thickness of that layer has gotten thicker. So you see that it's maximum over the Arctic. We know that that is connected up with a weakening of the west to east winds in the jet stream. And we suspect that that leads to a wavier pattern in the jet stream. This is stuff that we're still working on trying to prove. But when that jet stream is in a wavy pattern, we know that those waves move very slowly and they tend to cause some unusual weather conditions that tend to lead to the kinds of extreme events that are related to persistent weather patterns. But as I alluded to in talking about that El Nino, there are a lot of other factors that are changing simultaneously in the climate system. So sorting out how this new kid on the block, being this rapidly warming Arctic that we haven't seen before and all this loss of sea ice, how that's going to interact with 
other changes that are happening in the climate system, and just other natural fluctuations that are happening in the climate system, like El Nino, is still a wide open area of research. So there's still a lot of work to do, but it's very exciting work at the same time. So with that, um, I want to thank you again for coming. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. Thank you. If I can see you. Yeah, if we can. It's really hard to see from up here. <laughs> There's one um, way back there. Yes, and there are a couple of microphones that are, Kim has one and Taryn has one. Uh, so make sure you wait for the microphone because otherwise for the live streaming they won't be able to pick up the, uh, the sound. Thank you for that excellent summary. We don't hear much about the southern hemisphere, and I wonder what's going on down there and the Antarctic. That's a great question. Um, there's a lot of change happening down there as well, but it's very different from what's going on in the northern hemisphere. Um, Antarctica, for, to start with, is a continent, whereas the Arctic is an ocean. Um, We've got a lot of different factors happening in the Southern Hemisphere. For one thing, you've heard of the ozone hole, I'm sure. And because the ozone hole is actually recovering, more or less, although this year it's looking kind of bad, but on the whole it's recovering. And that's actually causing the upper layers of the atmosphere to cool during the winter time. And that is actually creating a stronger jet stream around Antarctica. And so we're seeing a very different um, situation unfolding down there. And that stronger jet stream down there is creating stronger storms, which is pushing the sea ice around Antarctica away from the continent. And that shows up as an increase in the amount of sea ice in the winter in Antarctica. So that's just a, and there's a lot of other things going on. There's a, there's a lot of melting going on on the undersides of the ice shelves that are coming off of the big ice sheet that sits on top of Antarctica. So we're seeing a lot of extra melting going on there, which contributes to this increase of sea ice because it's freshening the ocean. So it's a, it's a completely different place really, but um, yeah, so a lot of changes happening there too. Other questions? One here. I was just curious, is, what's the uh, level of ocean water, seawater doing? Is, sea level rise? Yes. Is there a, been able to tell anything historically from that? Uh, yeah. We know it's rising very steadily. Um, Especially in the last couple of decades, the rise in the increase in sea level seems to be accelerating, which is probably not a surprise. Um, and the reason for the sea level rise is basically two, and that is as the ocean warms, the ocean water expands. And also as we melt glaciers and as we melt ice sheets, so on Greenland and, and also parts of Antarctica, that water that's frozen on land when it melts adds mass to the ocean. So sea ice disappearing actually doesn't affect sea level very much, but that land ice when it melts does. And so those are the two main factors that contribute to sea level rise. And it's definitely happening much more rapidly now than it was even 30 years ago. Again, more bad news, I'm afraid. <laughs> John? Looking at the um, various displays of the jet stream and so forth. I've, it seems, just looking at the displays in various places, that Nebraska frequently is right in the middle of stuff. <laughs> so maybe it seems like we're sort of within the normal range that we've always known because it's cold over here and hot over here and we're sort of on the, on the border. Is that real or does it just look that way? No, it's actually real because um, climatologically, there tends to be a ridge or one of these northward bulges over California with a big dip over the eastern part of the country, or it's the other way around. And so it's true that Nebraska really does tend to be right in the middle. And that's kind of the winter pattern, though. Um, in the summer, there tends to be more of just a big, broad ridge 
um, over the whole continent, over both continents. So um, that's why it just tends to be hot, you know, over the whole continent in the summertime with not a lot of difference in temperature. So the pattern that you're referring to is more of a cold season pattern. And, um, you know, we have a, a, a word that um, Jeff Masters of Weather Underground um, came up with called weather whiplash, which I think applies really well to um, Nebraska because you are right on this borderline between cold or dry or stormy or clear. And so when that big wave that's been stuck in one place for a long time finally does shift across you, you get this big change in your weather. And it, la it lasted a long time from the previous conditions and then it lasts a long time after that wave passes. So I think weather whiplash is something that you send, tend to see a lot around here yeah. because of that. Yeah. Yeah, this is sort of a question of getting at where we may be headed ultimately. And, you know, in the past, say 10 to 20 million years ago, that we lived in an ice-free world, a lot warmer world. And I'm just wondering, in those kind of conditions, was a really intense storm? Because it would be a lot warmer, a lot more moisture in the atmosphere. Would it be a really intense jet stream? Do you know any speculation of what happened, you know, what it was like in an ice-free world? Yeah, well... You know, it's always colder in the poles than it is in the equator. So there's always going to be a jet stream of some sort. But in an ice-free world, it would certainly be weaker. Um, because you'd have, basically, that hill would be less steep. Um, having that ice up there allows the air to get colder than it would if it was open ocean. So that's one thing. Um, but as you say, there'd be more water vapor in the atmosphere because you'd have more exposed ocean and everything is warmer. Um, so that provides fuel for the storms, so it would be a hard, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, whether it would be stormier, it would certainly be, uh, when it rained, it would really pour, because you'd have all that moisture to work with. Um, but beyond that, I'm not really sure. Other questions? One in the back, over. Taryn, you're closer. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, got one here too. Yes. No. Um, I've heard about methane gases uh, emitted from the Arctic, and I didn't hear any comments about that. So would you talk a little bit about the methane gases, mm -hmm. if that's happening? Right. So the concern there is that the permafrost, so it, all around the Arctic Ocean, a lot of the land there is frozen, permanently frozen. That's why it's permafrost. And that, that frozen soil contains a lot of carbon in it in the form of moss and plant material and things like that. So the concern is that as the Arctic is warming so fast, that permafrost is also warming and it's starting to thaw. And as it thaws, it starts to release that carbon into the atmosphere. If there's oxygen present, it gets released as carbon dioxide. If not, it gets released as methane, both of which, of course, are, are greenhouse gases. Um, methane reacts very quickly with other things in the atmosphere, and so it doesn't last very long, unlike carbon dioxide, which I told you lasts over 100 years. So that's the upside of, of methane. The downside is there's a whole lot of it tied up in that ice. So if it were to thaw in a, on a large scale, um, and there's also more of it under the ocean as well and in, in, on the shelves of the shallow seas in the Arctic. So as the Arctic Ocean itself warms up, although it's got a long way to go before it thaws that, um, the concern is that there's all this potential additional greenhouse gas that could be emitted into the atmosphere and make a bad situation even worse. But I think most people feel that it's um, occurring very slowly, and so it's probably not something we're going to have to worry about in the near future. But it is something to keep our eye on for sure. Okay, now the question in the bag. A couple of slides uh, that you had talked about winds, the westerly winds weakening. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we live in the wind belt here. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Remember, these are winds high aloft <laughs> up in the jet stream. <laughs> so yeah. the, so it would be the upper winds, not yes. the ones down on the, we wouldn't experience less wind down here on the, uh, where we live. Um, yes, but for different reasons. So um, 
Probably what we're, I mean, there's some evidence that suggests that as the jet stream itself weakens and as this hill in the atmosphere is getting shallower, then because that temperature difference across the jet stream is getting weaker, that should have an influence on the surface high and low pressure areas also becoming weaker. And when those are weaker, and this was particularly in the summer this study was, um, if they're weaker, it's really that difference in surface pressure that creates surface wind. So if those do get weaker, then the average wind speeds should go down too. I guess the reason I'm asking the question is part of our ways of addressing climate change is to de develop more renewable energy. and Wind is one of those sources. And so we, we want to make sure that those decisions are good decisions. So I think there's going to be plenty of wind still for wind turbines. Well, that's what I assume, but, but sorry. That's what I assumed, but I yeah. didn't want to go too far. Yeah, that direction. if it's a if it's a decrease, I don't I don't think it's going to be enough to matter. Okay, to the well, and the reason I brought it up is I was at a presentation uh, at, a, at a round table a while back, and a person made the the assertion that wind would decrease on the surface because of this reason. So, yeah. I you're actually providing a bit of reassurance tonight. Thank you. I hope I'm right. <laughs> I think I am. Other questions? Yes, over here. Taryn is coming with the microphone, Rick. There's one here with a microphone already. Okay. Yeah, I, who, I have a question. Um, are there any unexpected or sort of emerging feedback loops that could tip these models much more quickly into a much faster warming scenario than they predict right now. In other words, this may not be a linear process. This may be an episodic process. Mm -hmm. um, so can you comment on that? Right. So your question was, um, do I think there's some perhaps feedback processes that could cause, um, you're talking about the warming of the globe particularly and then all these other effects that are related to that? Um, you know, we've been surprised by a lot of things happening in the climate system, but I think we've got a pretty good handle on the big feedbacks that are happening. Um, and I would be surprised if something that we didn't expect at this point um, comes along. If it does, it's probably going to be related to the ocean and changes in the ocean currents. Um, I, I don't think there's any other major feedbacks that we're missing at this point. We don't see it in the past. We don't see it in the, in the prehistoric record. Um, you know, big shifts that we can't explain. So I, I, think, I think we're OK. <laughs> OK, uh, Rick? Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, first, I'm going to echo others' comments on your excellent talk. It was very, very interesting and entertaining both, so thank you. Um, my question is a uh, comment you made in passing about the, the uh, large variation right now between CO2 and temperature. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you expand on that? And it, is, that, is that a typical lag? Is it because there's been such a rapid change in CO2? But please, some comments. Yes. It's because we've increased the CO2 and the con concentration in the atmosphere so fast. And the ocean is like a big flywheel in the system. And it takes a long time for that heat that's trapped by the greenhouse gases, um, which about 90% of it goes into the ocean. It takes a long time to heat water, basically. And so it just, that, that whole, that flywheel, getting that flywheel moving in this direction takes a long time. So yeah, it's all about the fact that we've put this stuff in the atmosphere so fast that the system hasn't caught up. And I just want to get back to that other question about feedbacks, because I did think of something that I should say. And that is, when it comes to biology, the, the ecosystem, there's a whole bunch of um, things that could happen in the ecosystem um, that affect food webs. And you know, we don't know a lot about how the ecosystem is going to respond to some of these big changes in the Arctic and ocean temperatures. Um, I think there's a lot of surprises that are coming our way in terms of the biology of, of the system.
I see another hand. Yes. Um, hello. As a teacher in a middle school science classroom, how do I help students understand the implications of climate change without frightening them? And also, how do I go about helping them see that they can make some changes that will have an effect, um, even short term, mm -hmm. or even uh, long term, depending on what they're studying and researching, um, trying to give students the opportunity to see that they can make a change and they can have an effect on what's happening. What yeah. kinds of things can you offer me as a teacher? Please. Great. Actually, thank you for that question because I usually try to end these really depressing talks on a happy note. <laughs> and that's not easy to do. But um, the happy, one of the happy notes, I think, is that um, this increase in extreme weather, which by itself is not happy, but the realization that people are coming to that it is somehow it is connected to climate change um, is changing people's conversations and it's changing businesses and it's changing the way people are behaving and the latest information that I saw was that now about 70 percent of Americans believe that humans are, are affecting the climate system and I think a lot of that has to do with this immediacy of these climate changes as opposed to what people had been hearing before where it was just going to be this you know, long-term gradual change of a degree or two and it just sounded like it was something that was way in the future. Well, what we're seeing are these changes that are happening fast, they're happening now, and we can start to make these links up with climate change. But getting to your question, um, you know, the, the bad news is that we've put all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it's going to be there a long time, so we've got a lot of change coming our way. But the good news is that everything we can do to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we continue to put in the atmosphere is going to help. It's going to make the problem less in the future. And so there's a zillion things that individuals can do on a daily basis to contribute to that. Um, you know, and I think that's one of the disconnects that's been hard to get moving in our country because people haven't taken this problem and put it in here. They've heard about it, they believe about it, they believe it, they might even you know, support um, a carbon tax or something like that, but they haven't taken it on board their personal behavior and thinking about every move they make every day. So I, when I talk to students, I talk about a lot of the things that they can do and they can yell at their parents to get them to do it too. Things like, you know, when you go in to get a coffee at Starbucks, you don't have to leave your car running. I mean, how hard is it to turn the key, right? How cold is your car going to get if you run in there for five minutes? Um, you know, bottled water. You really don't need bottled water. We have perfectly good water coming out of our taps. Um, you know, just a lot of little things. You know, don't run the dishwasher unless it's full. Turn off the hot water. Um, you know, don't let it run while you're doing the dishes. Try to buy appliances that are energy efficient. Um, if you are able to make modifications to your house to have better insulation or put solar panels on, or I mean, there's just, you know, all the things you've heard of, um, all that adds up. And if everybody's doing it, it really does make a difference. But as individuals, I think, um, and if you're over 18, I think one of the most important things you can do is vote for leaders who believe that this is a problem that has to get solved. So, you know, if there's one thing that we all do, that's something that'll make a big difference. One more. How do you get nine billion people to do this all at once? I'm sorry? How do you get the entire world to do this all at once instead of just North America? That, you know, that's the problem I see is it needs to be a bigger scope, how do you convince everybody in the world that this is a problem or you don't get the opportunity to industrialize like other countries already have? How do you address that? You guys are asking hard questions tonight. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, most of the world gets it. We're the ones that have been dragging our feet. Um, but you can't tell a developing country that they can't develop, right? 
but we can give them the technology that we have developed to allow them to grow without doing it based on fossil fuels or way less fossil fuels. So, you know, we've got the technology, the developed world has the technology, we need to help them grow but not follow in our footsteps. But really the rest of the world gets it. Most of them do. So, there's a question here. I'm going to ask a question Kim. real quick. I think she's had it do. for a while, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm walking around with the mic, but I'm just going to take the oh. opportunity to <laughs> ask a question since we're on this trend. Um, can you speak a little bit to your thoughts about the upcoming talks in Paris and whether or not you have any high expectations or hopes or whether or not the pledges thus far are sufficient enough to uh, create a sea change? They're absolutely not sufficient to create a sea change. I mean, we've got to make a huge dent in the amount of emissions of greenhouse gases. And, you know, from what I've read, they're way below what needs to happen. But as I said, every little bit is going to help. So I think we're starting to hear the right stuff being said. I think this COP is going to be better than all the previous ones. And hopefully the one after this is going to be more aggressive than this one. Um, so we're making progress but it's so slow and it's not enough, but it's better than nothing. I don't have high expectations, but it's progress. I have a question about the moisture in the atmosphere. You had mentioned that it has increased 7% in the last 30 years. Are there any predictions as to how fast it's increasing now or predictions into the future as to what it's gonna do? Yeah. So. It's a pretty good physical relationship between how warm the atmosphere is and how much moisture it contains. And so roughly for every degree of warming that we get on the planet, we're going to see about a 7% increase in the amount of water vapor. So as we continue to warm, which we certainly will, um, we're, we should absolutely expect to see more water vapor in the atmosphere too. Is there a deadline that you can see? When, when will it be too late for us to make significant difference in 50 and 100 years? There's no single deadline. Um, we're going to have a lot more change happening. That's something we've got to come to grips with. Um, so what we need to be thinking about is understanding better where those changes are going to be happening. For example, sea level rise, we had that question, you know, what cities need to um, start preparing for the sea level rise we know that's coming their way. And some areas on Earth are going to get more than other places. Um, in terms of this group here, um, understanding these weather whiplashes, for example, um, changes in the heavy precipitation events, if you know that that's something that we're going to see happen more often, then you know, the farmers around here, the people living here, the infrastructure, uh, the decision makers can start to make some plans with that kind of change um, expected. So, you know, it's, it's the part of climate change that we call adaptation. So knowing that these changes are coming, but doing a better understand, understanding better which regions are going to experience which kinds of changes so that we can help those decision makers prepare better. But, you know, there, I don't think there's any one deadline. We just have to do as much as we can as soon as we can. That's really now. now. Well, no. yesterday, you know, yeah. 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Right. Yeah. No, there's, it's, it's got to start really soon. Nebraska was the, uh, the, the leading state in the country to take advantage of the opportunity to sequester carbon uh, in exchange for the opportunity to participate in the, the incentives on the Chicago Climate Exchange. And uh, it seems to me that uh, we had over 3 million acres in Nebraska, for example, signed up in a very short period of time. And so agriculture, it seems to me, and agroforestry uh, have significant roles to play relative to their ability to be able to take carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it into the soil uh, and increase the 
uh, water holding capacity of the soil. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think, you know, like I said, there's a million things that need to happen all at the same time, and that's one of them. You know, places that can plant more trees, you guys have a lot of space, and that's something you can do. I'd love to see more wind turbines around here. Um, I'd love to see more solar panels in big patches around here. You know, those are all things that are going to help. And no one thing is going to do it, and it's going to take a whole bunch of um, efforts in different places, different ways, everybody contributing in different ways that's going to add up to something that'll make a difference. Welcome to Nebraska, the tree planter state and the home of Arbor Lodge. <laughs> Maybe we'll take one more question and then we should wrap it up. Yes. Um, speaking of trees, I wanted to hear your comments on their role in assisting <laughs> Uh, the issue or not, and then how do we have a conversation with our policymakers, both at the state and federal level? Because I've tried some time, but it seems to me that I've heard they don't think there's a problem. Um, how how do we have that conversation? Um, and what would you suggest? But especially I want to hear your comments on trees. Okay. Trees are good. You know, trees, like you said, they suck carbon dioxide. All plants suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn it into plant matter that dies and it goes into the soil. Or in the, in the case of trees, they last a lot longer. So you've got all this carbon tied up in, in the wood and the roots and, and everything. So, you know, planting trees is a really good thing. Um, as far as communicating with your, um, your leaders around here, um, you know, your pocketbook speaks quite loudly. Um, how you spend your money on, say, things like appliances and whether you support, um, whether you buy solar panels for your roof, you know, all the things that you can do with your, the power of your money um, is one way. Um, there's a lot of organizations that are bubbling up all over the country. I don't know what is here particularly, but you know, they're starting to get together and, and have a bigger voice in their local governments. You could join some committee in your town. Um, I don't know, our town has an energy management committee and we're trying to bring more uh, solar energy, wind energy, conservation, um, electric vehicles, those kinds of things to our town. So, you know, as an individual, you can get involved in things like that. But I really do, as I said at the end there, I think the conversation is changing. It's reaching pretty much everybody now. We're, we've seen this big uptick in the number, the, the percentage of Americans who believe that humans are causing the climate to change. So I think we're seeing a shift. I really do. It's not happening fast enough, but it'll come to Nebraska too. I would say in conclusion that, I mean, I agree totally with what you just said, and I, um, I see a lot of change in Nebraska. I see a lot of momentum that has been built, uh, particularly since the UNL climate change report was released, was a little over a year ago, and a lot of these uh, environmental groups, NGO groups and so on have really taken up this issue. So I think that's been a very, very positive thing. So I think there's a lot of momentum in this state. We just need to keep that moving forward. So once again, let's thank uh, Jennifer for her outstanding presentation. Thank you.